Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Miss Leanne Corette. All right, I need Squad 29 to stand up and give a big old shout out to Matt. Yeah, Matt. Squ hey, said Squad 29, stand up. Let's give him a big old round of applause. Yeah. All right. And I appreciate so many of you all sitting near the front. I'd seen a couple of the videos and not everyone was sitting near the front. So I want to give you all a particular thank you for that uh, because I was going to have to ask you all to move forward and that was going to take a little time. So I'm glad we didn't have to do that. Uh, so again, thank you so much for um, coming and uh, allowing me to speak today. This is a tremendous honor for the Boeing Company and for myself. Uh, you all mean so very much to us and I know we have an audience filled with not only cadets, um, servicemen and women, but also local community, and it is truly an honor. But it, I think it'd be a bit ironic if I stood up here to lecture all of you on character and leadership if you didn't know a little bit about myself. So I'd like to spend a moment and just uh, give you a little highlight about what we do at the Boeing Company. There is a question as old as time, heard round the world and in every heart. It thrills the imagination and gives wings to possibility. Its footsteps fill history and its hands hold destiny. It whispers in the dark and its echo shakes the earth. The question called to those who came before, and they answered with the incredible. It urged them to start small and think infinite, to pursue possibilities and dream no small dream, to see a future filled with hope and unite to build something better. Working together, they connected continents. Building the future of flight, they unlocked the stars. Leading their generation, they inspired ours. To dream high and fly far. To bind together and build the future. To lead our world and find new ones to honor their legacy and leave our own. Our founders heard the call and their answer lives on. From ocean waves to the edge of space, through our first century and into the next. Their memory remains. Now, it's our turn. The question is calling louder than ever. What will we dream next? So there's a lot of pride in that video, uh, but the words and the spirit of tenacity shine through. We're a company not just of engineers and logisticians and pilots and accountants. We're a company filled with incredible and amazing talent and leaders who have a lot of grit and a little bit of scrappiness thrown in so that we can really deliver capability to you and to make sure that you come home. Our focus is not just dreaming the next big thing, it's more importantly about making that dream come true. And that's a question of both leadership and credibility. In other words, can we follow through on our intentions and live up to the promises we made to deliver? And those questions are at the heart of this symposium. It really is what character and leadership is all about. 
I'm not sure what you know about me, but I'll tell you this. I have worked with some of the most brilliant minds over my 30 years with the Boeing Company. We have built and delivered some of the most advanced technical products, and none of that matters, not one single thing, if one person in the Boeing Company lacks integrity. Some of you may one day work with a Boeing satellite, receive technology from it. Maybe you'll fly our KC-46, and I hope for certain you'll train on our Boeing TX. But you wouldn't want to if you didn't know that you could depend on those systems. Because see, our promise to you is that you can trust the capability we can provide. I don't think of integrity as a lofty goal. I think of it as a mission critical element of performance. Can I count on my team to do the right thing? Can they be sure that I will do the right thing? Are we having the real conversations that we need to have, especially the difficult ones? These are the things that I worry about and think about as I lead a team of 35,000 people across this portfolio. And I can guarantee you that the integrity of my team is as important as making sure that there are wings on an F-15. It is a matter of trust because it's what we do. Several years ago, I was visiting one of my production sites. And as I do when I go in to visit different teams, I always make sure to ask the question, is there anything I can do to help? Now, as you all continue in your careers, there's going to be times when uh, you say you're here to help and people are going to laugh at you. I would almost submit that there are times today that people say they're here to help and you laugh at them because instead you get a lot more actions than you do help. And so while I was at this site visiting the production line, we were building aircraft, I shared with this team, is there anything I can do to help? I happen to be one of the eas most easily accessible people in the Boeing Company. Not because my schedule is any less different, but because I've made it a personal commitment that if anybody who reaches out to me, they get a return call or note from me within 24 hours clock time. Because I believe if someone has enough guts to reach out to me, I have the fundamental obligation of responding back. So after I finished the tours and all the great hoopla that goes along when uh, someone comes into a site, I went to the airport and I was sitting in the lounge area before getting on a Southwest flight, and my phone rang, and it was an employee. It was actually a mechanic on the floor. Hadn't even met him, actually. Hadn't had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He happened to be in a session that I was speaking at. And he goes, you need to know what's going on down here. Now, there is no greater test of courage than to have someone reach out and call and tell you that. And it's equally as much a test of your character to do something about it. Because what many people would do is say, I'll have someone get back with you. You'll put it into the chain, the chain of command. But you see, what leadership and character is all about, it's not about the chain of command. It's about ensuring that every link of that chain of command can stand independently and firm and can provide the value that needs so that the folks from chairman to technician knows that we're doing the right things for the right reason. And so this mechanic reached out and we found out that we were having an issue splicing wires. But not just any issue, we had delivered aircraft with a known problem that our quality system hadn't checked and found, that our engineers hadn't checked and found, and that our manufacturing supervisors had not checked and found. It was understood this was going on, and no one did anything about it. So two takeaways. One, my obligation to each of you is to deliver products and capability that ensure you come home. Your worst day 
is something I want to make sure you can have the passion and the confidence in that you can overcome. And while we fixed the issue, it pointed out that we had not just a breakdown of communication, we had a breakdown in the chain of command. You see, it's too easy to use the chain of command as a reason not to do something. It's extremely easy to protect yourself within the system. We have to have the courage as leaders, as individuals, from the shop floor to the corner office to make certain we're having the right conversations and we're open to fixing it. It took courage to make that phone call. Can you imagine what it took for someone to place a call to say, you need to know what's going on? Imagine how much worse it would have been if I hadn't acted on it. These gut-wrenching moments are the ones that are going to define you as a leader. These are the ones that, when no one else is watching, will define who you are. You see, we can talk about culture of the team. We can talk about character of the individuals. But it starts with each of us. It starts at the very top. And we have an obligation to do the right thing. I have a fundamental belief that most people do the right things for the right reason. I trust that people will speak up if something's going wrong. What I worry about is will they be listened to? Because I wasn't the first person that mechanic called. But I wanted to make certain that I was the last one he felt he had to call. As leaders or aspiring leaders, it's honest to model behaviors we want to see in the team. And we must set the example and create the environment for those behaviors to come alive. But I'm going to be really honest. Sometimes it's hard. How many of you all have ever had a bad day? You all have to self-identify. How many of you all have ever had a good day? How many of you all have ever had a bad day and a good day in the same day? And how many of you all would prefer to end on a bad note or a good note? Which one? Good, because we can sleep at night, right? Post 9-11. This aircraft asset, this Air Force asset, the E-4, how many of you all are familiar with it? Secretary of Defense's fleet of four aircraft. Many of you all remember, if you've read uh, the story, that on 9-11, a call could not be made off the aircraft. Boeing was contracted to um, put a new communication system on the aircraft. We had a lot of problems with the program. A very complex program, but we had a commitment to deliver on a certain schedule, and we were failing. As we were getting close to getting through the test program and getting to delivery, uh, my chief engineer, his name's Mike, he got a call from his wife, his son, had been diagnosed with cancer, 22 years old. Mike and his wife, Alice, had to go be with his son. The gentleman who was leading my operations team, his father-in-law had a massive stroke, and he needed to be with his family. And so we were operating in a pretty con high-risk, constrained environment with a lot of stress, a lot of pressure to deliver. And remember, your days aren't defined by the good ones. Your days are defined by the bad ones. Mike would call me every couple of days just to check in. You know, one day, somebody thought they saw a mouse on the airplane. And uh, our engineers documented it on a a piece of paper with a disposition of buying mouse traps. I mean, that kind of stuff. But we were having some real test issues with the fleet. We were having a hard time getting through all the certifications. And Mike would call to check in to make sure I was doing all right. Now, remember, his son, his 22-year-old son, was in the hospital 
undergoing chemotherapy. Now what a leader would do would have assured him that everything was under control. There is no need to worry. You are where you need to be. And that's not what I did. Rather, I shared with him how bad it was. I shared with him the risks that we might not deliver. I shared with him the customer's concerns. I shared with him the internal bureaucratic stuff we were going through. Because I was more worried about delivering and me than I was worried about Mike and his son. Now, we've been working long hours for a long time. We started our mornings with a stand-up at 5 a.m. We had our last stand-up at 11 p.m. We did that seven days a week, and we've been doing that for more than two years. It probably gives you a sign of the pain point we were under. Nothing like what you all face in conflict. Tough going still. Two days later, after one of those phone calls, guess who was in my office at 5 a.m.? Mike. What type of a leader makes someone choose between their son getting chemo and helping deliver an airplane? Not a very good one. As a result of delivering that airplane, he and I were standing on a flight line, and I looked at him, and I said, I don't like who I've become. Now, Mike's son is doing fabulous. He's, got, he's married, he has a family, he's got a brilliant career. I will forever be grateful to Mike and his wife, Alice. But I'm, what I'm even more grateful for is as that was a point in time 14 years ago that I had to decide what type of a leader I wanted to be. And if I didn't meet my expectations, then I had the ability to change it. You see, we spend a lot of times worrying about how other people should change. What I have found in my career is that we have a much easier time changing ourselves. And when things get tough, that's when you really learn not only who you are, but what you're made of. And so while I have a lot of uh, troubling thoughts about that program and how I behaved, I'm also really, I, you, I really am proud of the fact that I had an opportunity to change who I was. And I was blessed by an amazing team who hung with me through it all. What I will never forgive myself for and what has driven me since that day 14 years ago is that it is not about me. As a leader, it is not about you. It is about your team. This year's theme is ethics and respect for human dignity. And that is a core to the soups co-op that he wrote. I had the pleasure this morning of sitting down and spending an hour with him. And I have to tell you, I have never felt so inspired, and you all are so very blessed to have him leading this fine institution. His essay made a strong case for many practical benefits of inclusion. And I was moved by the elegant explanation of why diversity matters. Our best measure, he said, of success is the effectiveness we deliver on the battlefield or the war we, pre we prevent because of our collective skill. I agree with that 110% results matter, but I believe it applies more than to the battlefield. The value of diversity enhances every endeavor. And I know that not everyone here has a military background. I don't have a military background. We have folks from the community with first responders, teachers, civic leaders. While we all work in different occupations, almost all of us are united in a common sense of purpose, service to others. And that's perfect because these principles apply whether you wear a uniform or a suit or however you dress. If effectiveness is the measuring stick we go by, 
then we owe it to our teams to reward their performance based on their contributions to the team, not how they look or whether they fit a certain mold. When I first started at Boeing 30 years ago, I can tell you I was told I would never make management. I laughed too much. I smiled too much. Luckily, times have changed. I made management. But my real takeaway is we too often judge. And we judge based on where we sit and what we value. We must never lose sight of who each of us are, because that's what makes you special. It's what allows the real conversations to have. It's what makes us unique in a way that makes the team incredible. Growing up, I had no idea I'd actually end up working at Boeing. And I can't even tell you that I probably was more surprised than anyone when I was asked to lead our defense space and security business. And what's really ironic is that my parents actually met at our Boeing facility in New Orleans, Louisiana, where we were building the Saturn V rocket. I bleed Boeing blue. I am second generation all the way through, and I've had the fortune to not only be at Kennedy Space Center as my dad was helping take men to the moon, but to be back at Kennedy Space Center as we take humans back to space later this year. But when I was in college, I knew one thing. You see, I wasn't like you all. I'm a state school grad. There was always going to be someone smarter than me. No matter how hard I tried, someone was always going to be more successful than me. But one thing I knew, I had heart. And like grit, heart is really important because it drives you. It drives your style, it drives your behavior, and it makes the impossible seem possible. And that trait has struck with me throughout the career and is probably one of the reasons why I have the position I do today. But that trait transitioned a couple of years ago to a real focus on our customer. And I don't mean that to say I didn't always care about our customer because I've always been very focused on the warfighter. But it changed a day in 2011. So I find stories are the best way of telling one's life. A mom called me. How many of you all have ever had a mother call you that's not your mom? And if was it good news when they did? Very rarely. So imagine sitting in an office near, uh, near the end of December, near the Christmas holiday, and a mother calls you on your line. And she says, I want to thank you for building Chinook helicopters. Now I have to tell you all, it's a bit of an uh, odd conversation. And so as I stumbled through my appreciation for her call and my thanking her for taking the time out of her day to call me, I said, why are you calling me? I mean, really, why? And she said, my son was in the Army. He was a ground troop. They were in an armored vehicle. It struck an IED. Most of the team was killed. He was severely wounded. A Chinook flew in and got him to a local field hospital where he was stabilized, and a C-17 brought him back stateside. She said, I'm calling to thank you because what you do enabled my son to come home for Christmas. You see, each one of you is somebody's son or daughter, somebody's brother or sister, somebody's family or friend, each one of you matters. And that's when my mission went from customer first people always to really being about customer first people always. Because there's a difference about saying it versus living it. And that story that day was the second transformation in my career. 
You see, the first was when I realized that people first mattered. I should never put Mike in the position where he had to make a critical decision. Choose between family and work. The second is realizing that we do have a higher calling and that our responsibility is to ensure not only do you get to where you need to go, use whatever product is at your disposal to give you the ultimate edge because we never want any fight to be fair but to ensure that you always come home. That is what the people of the Boeing Company stand for. That is our promise and our commitment to you. Last week, I had a day-long meeting with all of my senior leaders. And we had the honor of having uh, Lieutenant General Chris Nolan, the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, come visit. I wanted my leadership team to hear from him not only about the evolving threats, but also to hear a tough message. Improving ourselves is not a luxury. It is a necessity. Don't think about change as something you must do. Think about change as something you want to do. It is too easy to be complacent. It's just as dangerous at a national security level as it is at a personal level. We always have to be reaching higher, looking farther ahead and outdoing ourselves. I can guarantee you our competitors and our adversaries are doing it. I should also mention that we talked about our own Boeing behaviors. The behaviors that we want to mimic from chairman to technician one set for everyone. And it's probably no surprise to you to hear that the qualities we emphasize closely align to the Air Force values. Because no matter what organization you're running, leaders are expected to behave a certain way. The tradition of honor at the heart of the Airmen's Creed and the core value of integrity first means doing what is right even when no one is looking and that is when it's most important. These are not values to be kept on a shelf or behind a glass wall. Real leaders bring them to life every day, which is why it's a real honor for me to be here to talk to you about a couple of my stories, because that's what this forum is all about. For over 25 years, you all have been bringing in individuals to talk about their stories, some which are difficult to hear, some that leave you raw, but there are opportunities for you to learn from others and not have to experience it yourself. But you can't learn leadership from a speech. It is built out of your experiences. You really can't measure it or see progress like you see parts of an aircraft coming together. It kind of soaks in. And as you can tell by the stories I've told, after nearly 30 years with the career of with the company, I'm still learning my leadership journey. But perspectives help, and that goes back to diversity and the respect for different ideas and ways of thinking. I believe we have come an incredible way on ensuring opportunities exist for those who want to advance, regardless of race, creed, gender, but I'm gonna be really clear. We are nowhere near where we can be. We have so many great opportunities in front of us. And this needs to be more than a moment in time. This must be a movement. And you're the generation that is going to help us get there. So I've spent way too much time speaking. And I think we're going to move into questions and answers. So who wants to go? Now, you all don't get out early. Thank you very much for your uh, words, ma'am. Uh, at this time, we'll begin Q&A. Um, so you can go ahead and start, and then at the end, I'll let you know when we have one question remaining. Thank you. Ms. Corrette, I'm Dr. Chris Lee I'm with the Center for Character and Leadership Development. So very nice to meet you. Very nice. We're very happy you're, you're with us today. Thanks for the, the great presentation and, and really getting down to the to the key values and ethics that are important in everyday life. But principles have costs. And I can think of your uh, field, you know, there is 
shareholders, you know, there are financials that are associated with it, um, and you are a corporation that is designed to make a profit. Um, so I know, my question, dirty, rotten, yeah, I know, sorry. No, so I, I guess, you know, <laughs> it begs the question, you know, you've got all kinds of stories about greed and corporate America and that, but the idea of the ethics, the idea that we have a, an obligation, <laughs> um, knowing that as you attack that uh, or, or embrace it, that it could have a real effect on your bottom line. Uh, can you talk about that, yeah. at least from the corporate side? I think it's actually uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, financial outcomes are just that, they're outcomes. I have a fundamental belief. If you treat your people right, if you do the right thing for your customers and what they need, the financials follow. That means when you all come back uh, from, an, um, from being on a, a TDY, we understand what worked and what didn't work with the products we provide to you all. When we look at what you all want for the future, it's not about us showing up and telling us what you need. It's about you telling us what you need and us listening. I have yet to run a business in the Boeing company, and I have run several, that as long as we stay focused on doing the right things by our team and doing the right thing for our customers, the financials follow. And I think if you look at the performance of the Boeing company, you'll see that there's a really strong linkage there. If you place financials in front of those types of things, if you place financials in front of leadership and character, if you put financials in front of your people or your customer, you won't have people, you won't have a customer, and you will be out of business. You see, I don't think there's a conflict. Again, do the right thing for the right reason with integrity, and I have confidence the outcomes will be there. Thank you. Hello. Ma'am, uh, I'd like to make that question a little harder, please. Okay. Uh, doing the right thing here in America fits our society. We all expect it, and, and it does work. Uh, across the world, in many countries, corruption is the way business is done. You have to deal with selling very expensive things in other countries. Uh, frankly, in my four years experience working with the Air Force, uh, some other aircraft companies have become very publicly in trouble mm -hmm. for passing money under the table That's to right. foreign governments. How do you address that at Boeing? Well, we'll address it a number of ways. One, it is unacceptable. So let me be very clear. We will walk away from business with a country, an individual, or a representative of a country, because many times they hire consultants and want to do business through consultants, uh, that uh, are not ethical and are illegal. We train every employee in the Boeing company on that very practice. We do ex very exhaustive reviews of any consultant domestically and outside the US in terms of their own background, their reputation. Because what you don't want to be is one of those companies you see in the newspaper. See, the problem is too many people worry about quarter over quarter short-term performance or a deal for the day. The reality is you have to live with these decisions forever. We have 140,000 people who work for the Boeing Company. We have an obligation to the retirees that have come before those in the 100 years that we have been in existence and to that next generation to do the right thing. And we walk away from folks who have unethical behavior. I will go even farther than that. The Boeing Company is viewed in a totally different way than we were just 20 years ago as a result of a major ethical breach. We are not proud of that time in our company's history, but we have learned from it, and ethics is core and central to everything we do. We do not tolerate escapements. Thank you for the thumbs up, that was awesome. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I'm, I'm are you all gonna be, are you gonna be fun? 
Yeah. That wasn't there. Yeah, let's do. Yeah, we're gonna do a fun. Yeah, one. Sure. Okay, so, right. uh, yeah, yeah. Let's do a fun one. All right. Yeah. So, in, with regards to the theme of the series, and CLS, you know, respect and and, and human dignity. Um, so, Boeing, you said earlier, um, expects the best from their employees, and you're basically evaluated on your con on contribution to the company. So, earlier this morning, I attended the transgender panel, which was hosted by Logan and Layla Ireland, and I'm just uh, asking. Does Boeing have like a bias towards their contribution on the people, or is it just like an absolute on based on your contribution as an employee? Does being transgender with Boeing affect contributions to the company, if you've seen previously? And since Boeing is so in in intertwined with the military, um, should the military take a different stance on tra on transgenders at the moment? So I'm not going to speak to U.S. military policy. I'll let uh, General Dunford uh, and the Secretary of Defense speak to that. I'll speak to Boeing. The Boeing po um, policy is, and we have, been re um, we have been recognized for it, is centered around diversity and inclusion. It is a key tenet of who we are. Uh, we have um, been um, one of the forward-leaning companies in terms of how we ensure that people have an environment that is conducive to them as individuals. Um, and so there is no limitation in the Boeing company based on race or gender or any of those conversations because we want to be not just the best aerospace company in the world, we want to be the best industrial company in the world. And to do that, you need everybody and you need access to the entire population so we can have the very best talent. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Cadet Fourth Class, Kirk. Okay, that wasn't any easier than the one before, so okay. <laughs> this one's probably a little different, but I remember reading last year that the Boeing CEO was saying that the first humans to step on Mars are going to arrive on a Boeing rocket, so I was wondering with your commitments with the commercial crew program with NASA, mm -hmm. space defense, and all of that, how do you balance also innovating to get people to Mars first? Well, it's a very exciting time to be part of the space program, and I have to share with you from a personal perspective, having my parents involved in the Saturn V program, and then having just been down at Kennedy Space Center earlier this week to host the vice president on our commercial crew program as part of the national space program, I mean, this is a time for where we're going in the future is important. I think it's also important to reflect on General Hyten's comments and the Secretary of the Air Force's comments about how the war and the conflicts are gonna escalate and be in space. Space is the new frontier. The Boeing company operates from seabed to space, and we invest according to those priorities. Uh, the chairman, like me, is very enthusiastic about our, not only our space per, um, business and where we've been in the past, but that the Boeing company is new space, and we have the benefit of having 60 years of unparalleled experience to ensure we learn the lessons to deliver humankind going forward. And don't count my chairman out. I'll tell you what, he and I are going to be racing for that spot on that trip to Mars. Thank you, ma'am. He pushed me off the TX flight. No, just say, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. I'm Cadet First Class Haley oh, Spletzer. Yes. Uh, I want to ask, ma'am, you mentioned a time that you had realized you had become a leader uh, that you didn't want to be. Uh, what fundamental steps did you take after that realization? You know, that is a great question because in my mind, I would thought I could just make the switch and everybody would get it, you know, but let me be really honest. You know, you don't get to that point uh, of being that way and behaving that way where people um, embrace you. Um, rather, they run from you. I mean, it's always a really good sign that when nobody wants to take your phone calls or they dread having a meeting with you, there, there may be a problem. So that's you know, a good boundary condition to set. Um, that was a Friday night at a, um, when we were delivering that aircraft. Monday morning, I went in and I had a full meeting set like I normally did. And uh, we had some tough topics that we needed to cover. And um, I realized then that I had lost the trust of the team. It took me a year to gain that trust back. And it took a year of every day, not only my own self-management, because I had been accustomed to who I was, and they had been accustomed to my reactions. Um, it's kind of like getting a bad grade here at the Air Force Academy. It doesn't seem like it's that hard to get a bad grade, but it sure takes a lot of time to offset it later on, right? You have, it only takes one moment to lose trust. It takes incredible amounts of time and energy to regain, and that's really the first step, was 
to be true every day and to ensure people called me out. See, I surround myself by people who aren't going to say yes. I surround myself by folks who are going to tell me what I need to hear, whether I want to hear it or not. And you have to be open to that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. This is Cadet Fourth Class Barber from CS38. Uh, my question Which is like close to 29, but not 38. So should I have asked you all to stand too? I mean, it would have been fine. <laughs> all stars represent. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kid Carl. There you go. Okay. <laughs> My question is uh, at USAFA, we have a lot of leadership doctrine, and one of the things that's been pointed out is that leaders have uh, varying degrees of uh, personality traits, ranging from more authoritative to a little bit more democratic. My question was Has there ever been a situation, whether it regards ethics, morals, or even finances, where you've had to adjust your, um, adjust your approach in order to handle something? Yes. I just wanted to make you all laugh. Yes. No, seriously, yes. Every day. I mean, uh, what I say matters. What I do matters. There are certain issues that I need to take a stand on. I need to be extremely visible and vocal on, and people need to understand this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, and if it involves someone who's not behaving according to our behaviors, um, we deal appropriately with that. But you know what you all realize, and I mean you feel it, but you have to realize there are, you are going to be in meetings, you're going to be in uh, situations where with the single roll of the eye, the single smirk, the single not responding to an email or a phone call, or just not having time, you're going to make or break somebody's day. As leaders, we carry an incredible burden to make sure we are giving everybody a chance. At the same time, we also carry an incredible burden that you just can't talk about it, you have to walk the talk. And so you do have to take moments, and absolutely yes, you adjust your style every day to accommodate those situations. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, look, this is, okay, I'm starting to figure out the system. It's only taken me a while, but now I'm getting it. Okay. Uh, hello, ma'am. This is Cadet First Class Holmes. My question is, does Boeing have any plans to weaponize space? Well, I'm going, so I would say the real question you should ask is, does the U.S. government have any plans to weaponize space? Yes. And um, I will let you read the doctrine from General Hyten. Uh, we are clearly in partnership with uh, uh, the department on different, oppor different opportunities that exist. Did I do that good? Anybody, how did I, is that a nine or a 10? What did I get on that one? Uh, good morning. Good. I'm is... coming back to this way now. Okay, all right, I got it. I'm C4C Malcolm Owens from the Fighting Fourth. Um, I have a question. Now, why did you get to say that you're like the fighting fourth and the guy from the 38th didn't say anything and Matt, you didn't tell me what the, oh, okay, I'm just asking. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a question regarding your, um, your, your testing programs and policies. If you were to, you, you know, you're going through the, the design of the Boeing TX and you're adding. Do you want us to win? What? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just saying, just saying, okay. And you know, you continuously fix or make new modules for existing planes, like the F-15, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Do your band of test pilots and you know, test engineers talk with the Air Force test pilots and engineers a lot during the development, or do you guys just like compare notes, or do we verify what you made afterwards? Um, it's a combination. So a um, majority of our test pilots actually are former servicemen and women, whether Air Force pilots or Naval pilots. Um, and we have multiple crews participate, whether it's the TX or the KC-46. It is a constant conversation. Now, let's talk KC-46. It is an embedded test team. So there is Air Force pilots and Navy pilots on board with, US, um, with uh, Boeing pilots, testers, Aeros, everybody. And, you know, so it's all integrated and there's a lot of conversation. And a best solution is one where people come together and we can fine tune and nuance it uh, to meet the needs of the warfighter. On something like TX where we're building something for a competition, at this point in the stage we've built it, we get a lot of feedback and share with folks that we've brought in uh, to understand what we've done. But we'll have to com we've comply with the formal competitive process in terms of how we deliver our test data and things like that. So it depends on whether you're under contract or if you're building something new, the approach. But either way, we make certain that um, in our workforce, um, available to us are folks who have operated in uh, conditions 
needed to train in conditions so that when we deliver a product or service, it reflects what uh, you all need. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. I'm Cadet 4th Class Lewis, uh, Squadron 16. So earlier you mentioned... Hey, look at that. You got a cheer. Good for you. <laughs> earlier you mentioned uh, coming back this week from the Space Council meeting with uh, the Trump administration. And um, I know as interest in space increases, one of the concerns is that our government's kind of underfunded and like their ability to operate within space. And a question that's raised is, how will private space companies such as Boeing take the lead and the initiative in that? So do you feel that um, you're gonna work in a support with NASA or that you're gonna more take the lead on your own? and uh, just make those innovations yourself. How does that work, the private space industry? Well, for instance, the conversation around privatizing space, let's say privatizing the International Space Station, of which Boeing is very proud to have been there from day one as we started assembling it um, on the ground and then up in space. Uh, we're gonna make certain we're part of the conversation so we understand what it means, but we need to bring forward ideas. We need to invest and we need to continue to innovate. You know, this is all about not only disrupting ourselves, but disrupting the marketplace as we know it today. And you just can't sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody to tell you what to do. The reason the National Space Council was formed was to bring not only the interest back, but to get the conversations flowing so we can identify what works and what doesn't work as we um, accelerate what needs to be done in space and as we move to more, more commercialization and privatization. So we're there at the forefront. We're going to be there in the conversations. And yes, we are investing as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Cadet Fourth Class Near from Squadron 18. Um, <laughs> Wow, you like brought a lot more folks with you, didn't you? Ma'am, with uh, the theme of you this... You were supposed um, to say, yes, I did. Oh, well... <laughs> They're great. You always say, like, say, hey, give a shout out to your, your team, your squadron. So, uh, Night Riders for Life. There you go. Okay, there you go. Um, Ma'am, with the, uh, the theme of this conference in mind, uh, respect for human dignity, I was wondering what you do as a senior level leader to create or maintain a culture of dignity and respect across such a, a huge group of people because you really do manage a, a, an enormous group. So um, how, or well, yeah, what strategies do you use to try to create that culture across you know, such, a, such a big group? Um, my, uh, I don't know that you would per se call it a strategy. I guess it's a piece of it. Being accessible is the number one thing. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I, you know, I graduated from Kansas State University. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, I graduated from Kansas State University. You know, I had no belief that I would ever be running our defense business. You know, we have incredible men and women who work for our company. Um, and to create that culture of dignity and respect just means valuing everybody. And I think about how many times people have paid it forward for me, put me in a position or a job where I clearly wasn't ready because in most times, most of us aren't ready for whatever that next new challenge is. But they believed in me, and we have an obligation to continue to pay forward. And when you operate from a perspective of um, accessibility um, and gratitude, I'm grateful that I have this job. I feel incredibly blessed that I have this in job, and I hope every day I represent the Boeing Company as best as possible. Um, it changes the conversation. This isn't about an office or any of those types of things. Those could all be gone tomorrow. The greatest honor I have is that I work with an amazing group of individuals who do amazing things. And so honoring them, giving them the time, making sure I know who they are, um, it makes it personal. And I think when you make something personal, that's what allows that dignity and respect to exist. People are not numbers to me. They are people. And they're my friends. I mean, it's a Boeing family. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Colorado. Thank uh, you. I like Colorado. Thank you. Uh, uh, comment first. I deployed a number of times, and often the F-15s were the jets we were with. And um, thank you, McDonnell Douglas and Boeing jets, and, uh, and many, many combat zones. So they did great. Thank you. Uh, kind of a comment and question, more to the point of uh, R&D. Uh, the firm I'm with is an advanced uh, outfit on R&D, and also we're VCs, venture capitalists. And we have uh, uh, interest and support of um, SpaceX. And it appears SpaceX has taken a lead on a number of technologies. 
And uh, in the next 20 years, they'll be leading in many respects as we have shown that they can land their own rockets now. Mm. Uh, so a comment or a question is, how, how, are, uh, how is Boeing and Lockheed going to compete in the next 20, 25 years against SpaceX and then some of their fabulous technologies? And <clears throat> possibly are you prepared for SpaceX in the next 20 years to look at buying your, your company? Because that might be a possibility in the next 20 years with the way they're going. So, some, so some I stuff think, there. So, uh, just I'll sit throw down it. I'll sit I, down and listen because I need to sit down. Do you, are, are you not feeling well? I've got an injury. So. Oh, well, bless your heart. Yes, please. Um, I love the competition. You see, you're talking to a space baby. You're talking to someone who grew up in the vestiges of space with parents who grew up in that. And I could not be more excited about what we're doing in the future. I'm excited about the conversation. I'm excited about the National Space Council. And there is nothing like a good old space race to get the blood going in all of us. Do I think uh, SpaceX is going to buy the Boeing company? No, I do not. Do I think that there is great innovations happening of SpaceX? Of course I do. Do I think there are brilliant technologies and innovations happening at the Boeing Company in space? I absolutely do. This is, this is not a game of a day. This is a game of an entire generation as we shift our focus from just an airborne layer to a space layer. And I think what it has created is an incredible amount of excitement and energy we are recruiting people to aerospace the way we did back in the 60s. We're bringing a vibrancy back that hasn't existed before. And I think we sell this entire uh, movement short by making it a competition against two, between two companies. Because there is great technologies across a number of companies um, in this space, being space. And Boeing's going to be at the front and center of it. And uh, we are very clear in our commitment uh, to remain number one in human space exploration. Uh, we are very um, focused on uh, getting our Starliner into space, which is our commercial crewed capsule. But we're also very focused on making sure it's done uh, in a way that uh, is safe as well as um, affordable. And those are two disruptions that are occurring in the market space today. And so I, all I can say is it's a very exciting time to be where we are, and, um, if, uh, and I wouldn't count Boeing out. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah, at this time, we'll have one final question. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Harris. I'm from Norwich University Corps of Cadets. Uh, my question for you is, what are some leaders that have influenced you in your leadership development, and what traits do you admire from them? You know, I, uh, I've learned a lot of things from some incredible leaders. I mean, I have uh, men and women inside and outside the industry who have, uh, who have guided and counseled me. I have um, mentors from uh, the aerospace field in general, unlikely people that I talk to, because you get advice and counsel from lots of folks. Um, but probably the most important person who has influenced me from a leadership and character perspective was my mother. Um, and I don't say this lightly, and my mom will watch this maybe at some point, or maybe she won't. Uh, but, you know, my dad taught me more of the math and science, and that's kind of what you get surrounded by in this industry. My mom taught me something that... Um, is really important to me. She taught me grace. Grace is winning the right way and losing the right way. Grace is able to answer the question that was so eloquently asked of me just a moment ago. You see, grace is about not throwing rocks when you live in a glass house. Um, and so I look at everything through that lens. I think how we are defined is our conversations in private and in public. I think it's by our actions in private and in public. Um, and I think it's our willingness to have people advise and counsel us in private and in public. Um, and so I credit my mom uh, for giving me the gift of grace. And I only hope I do half as good a job as she did. So thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. And thanks, Mom. Thanks. Is that the last question? That was the last question, ma'am. Well, you're no fun. Are you going to have you? What's your guys' motto thing? What are, you, what are you all? DJ. Yeah, right there. Two fine, two nine. That's all you say? Two fine, two nine. Oh, two fine. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Here we go. Give it up for Matt. <laughs> all right, nice job. You did a nice job. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ma'am, on behalf of the uh, Cadet Wing and the Air Force Academy, we'd like to thank you for uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule. It's very He's busy. very proper. I, I have to be. I'll get in trouble if I'm not. Okay. Is there somebody here that could yell at you? Probably. Oh, okay. All right, all right.